Hello everyone. Welcome to another video in the series of how to judge videos that the Novisat EUDCCA team is publishing in the lead up to Novisat Euros, which as I'm speaking is only two weeks away and we're very, very excited to welcome you all. Today's lecture is going to be on how to have a great panel discussion. This is, I think, very important because it helps you in outlining the ways in which you can discuss the call in a convenient manner without feeling frustrated. We hope that this video will help you have better and more productive discussions that take into account everyone's viewpoints about the debate and making you sure that you can come to the correct decision that all the panelists can agree upon. Obviously, that won't always be the case, but we hope so that it will happen for you in the majority of the cases. You can watch this video in two ways. We hope that you'll find this video in and of itself informative enough. But if you have a more specific question that often relates to that you've had a difficulty in a panel discussion in a previous debate round. If that is the case, what I suggest you do is you just think for a few seconds while posting this video about such an incident that you have. And then with that memory fresh in your mind, you then watch the rest of the video and you see whether any of the advice jumps out at you and whether that advice can be particularly helpful. I would also suggest that alongside watching this video, you read our judge briefings and other documents because they too will help you with making sure that you become the best prepared judge at Novisite Euros. I'll be talking about three things. First, I'm going to set out the general principles that I think guide a panel discussion. Secondly, I'm going to look at how you design the process of a good panel discussion. Things you can expect both to do as a chair, and you can expect to receive when you are a wing judge in a round. And thirdly, I'm going to look from the perspective of both the chair and the wing and give you some concluding tips. Let's then get started with the first thing. So what are the guiding principles of a panel adjudication? The first thing that is important to note is that a panel adjudication tries to reach a consensus decision, but doesn't have to reach a consensus decision. That means that it is legitimate to split from someone else's call. That includes that it is legitimate to split the call from the chair judge. So if you feel strongly together with your other panelists or panelists that the call you have is more correct than the chair judge, you are allowed to vote against the chair judge, but only after you've tried to come and reach to a consensus, which means that you start coming into the panel trying to be persuaded, both trying to persuade the other person of the view they hold about the debate and to make sure that you can be persuaded of the view that you hold about the debate. And we are free to do so during a panel. The second thing that's important is that there that a panel discussion can take only 15 minutes during the in-round of euros. And 15 minutes, I think, may sound to the person who's new to judging as a relatively short time period. You've just watched the debate that took place over nearly an hour. And you need to condense that. There's not what people are saying, but also your reasons for thinking that that ranks opposite to other teams. And not just one team, but three other teams. And you need to do that all in 15 minutes. Some of the design questions that we're going to talk about later on are going to deal with how to maximize the efficiency of making a call. But bear in mind that this also means that you want to make sure that you can bring short and understandable points when you're doing a panel adjudication. So you try and come up with your ideas beforehand. You take good notes. You think about the reasons for your decision already during the debate and not after the debate, because you're going to have to get ready relatively soon to give your judgment call on the round. The third thing that is important, therefore, is to think about the fact that you need to be both prepared and condensed. Now, your ear has given some of, some of the useful feedback on note-taking, so I won't do that part as well. Just watch his video in order to help you in that regard, or read some of the notes if you want to know more about note-taking. All of that is also written down in our uh, briefing. So bringing therefore in mind that you need to be A, prepared. You want to make sure that you have your call ready relatively soon after the debate has ended so we can start with your initial discussions. 
two, you want to try and condense your points. So you want to make sure that the main points come out. And three, you want to be decisive. You want to make sure that you both decide on where, where you agree and disagree, that you can be both persuaded and persuasive. If you keep those ideas in mind, you make sure that you have the basic outline of a panel discussion. Let's look a little bit then at the process. We recommend that after a debate is concluded, you spend about a minute to look over your notes. That is helpful just to clarify some last things you want to get clarified and to find out whether things are sure and to make sure that you're ready to start a discussion and you have your main points onwards. The second thing that we then suggest is that you bring out the initial calls. So the chair will go and ask everyone to give their initial one to four ranking of the teams. And then the chair gives that ranking themselves as well. The reason why chairs do this last is to make sure that people don't get the feeling they need to sway with the chair, but that they give their own ranking, because that is the most productive way to do the discussion. This process, probably you want to make it as fast as possible, which means that if you're a wing, for instance, and you find it difficult to come up with a call, you can say so, and there's no real harm being done there. You can basically say, I have difficulty in establishing a call. That might mean that you don't have a full call. So you, for instance, might be very certain that one team took the first, one team took the fourth, but you really doubt between two, between two and three. And you can give that information when you give your first call. Or it might be, mean that you're totally confused. At that point, you're just fighting that you're gonna be very difficult to be confused. Um, you might fact at this point that you might, may have one outstanding question. And if that question hits, then you feel much more comfortable participating in the discussion. But what I wouldn't suggest is that you already ask that question. You're going to make this process therefore more longer and you're going to do something that the chair doesn't expect. So therefore you're wasting a little bit of everyone's time. So make sure that you have flagged that you have that question. And at the moment that we have everyone's call and the chair can think of how they want to start the adjudication discussion, that you're then going to be able to flag that question or question that you might have. If everyone is given their call, there are a couple of options on the table, depending on what the calls look like. The first of these is a situation where everyone has virtually the same call. You might think, great, let's relax now. But you're not entirely done yet. Before you go towards speaker points, you do want to discuss the, this call. And you want to do so for two reasons. The first of these reasons is to make sure that everyone has good reasons for giving everyone that ranking. So you want to make sure that, for instance, all, chair, all, all, all judges believe that the right reasons have been given. That is important, one, because it can help you with, with identifying what good points of feedback for certain teams are. Two, because that means that judges can learn from each other and can see how good everyone is in judging, which is then going to be helpful in filling in feedback and therefore giving eventually CA teams information on who a good judge is and who is not a good judge. Maybe. But three, to make sure that you have the strongest reasons in the call. The second thing you want to do is play a little bit of devil's advocate. It might be the case that everyone agrees on the call, but a call can still be quite tight. There can still be reasonable reasons to disagree. You just all happen to, to go to one side of that disagreement. You want to test that out. And therefore, you want to see if you can put a bit of a devil's advocate roles during close calls and find out whether you are actually in the right. The second thing that might happen is that there is only disagreement on two sets of teams. Then that means that that is going to be the thing you want to talk about first, because that is likely going to be the most contentious in the round, and you definitely want to allot most time of it of the 15 minutes. The third thing that might happen is that there's going to be a lot more divergence, sometimes even total chaos. If there is more divergence, what you're going to look at is you want to see how many differences between teams exist. Judging is a bilateral exercise, so we judge themes against other teams, which also means that we can't, for in, you can't, for instance, say, well, opening government won from opening opposition because closing government defeated opening opposition points. You want to look at the relative contribution of opening opposition and opening government. What that means is that if there are multiple disagreements, is you want to look at how many disagreements there are and therefore how many bits of discussion you're going to have. And you want to divvy that up, say if you have three points of contention in that discussion, you then are probably going to want to spend roughly three minutes discussing each comparison. 
If there is total chaos, the suggestion is to try and judge the debate chronologically as happened, to try and find out where disagreements are. Usually by the time that you've discussed the first comparison, that then between opening government and opening opposition, then you might already feel a lot more certain about where the re rest of the debate slots in. Alternatively, the reason for chaos might be due to everyone having the same question on their mind and not being able to answer that question in the same satisfactory manner. For instance, was that legitimate counterprop? Did opening government scroll? Did closing government actually bring a new extension? And what did the extension do with the rest of the debate? If you can find out that that question is on everyone's minds, answering that question first before you move on to a discussion comparing all the teams to one another might be a more useful strategy to move into. Now let's briefly go after we've seen how many different compositions exist of initial calls and how discussions can develop from that towards speaker points, which is what happens at the moment that you are done with this discussion. Speaker points are an important part of debating. They matter, first of all, because they are tiebreakers during the break. So it means that people get the break based on speaker points very often as well. And secondly, people often use speaker points to guide their process. Did they think this was a good speech or a better speech than other speakers? And therefore, if I give this speech, this speech was considered good or not good, and this speech was considered, and the other speech was considered good or not good, what was then good about that other speech? So people use it as a feedback mechanism. So you want to make sure that you score speeches in the right way. One way to do this is to look at the speaker table. The speaker table gives you rough descriptions of what a speech that falls within a certain range should look like. Obviously, a speaker, a speaker doesn't have to, to provide all three or four elements of something that's in the bracket in order to receive a score that is within that bracket. They can, for instance, have three scores that fit entirely within this bracket and one below. And that might still mean that they have a speech that belongs more in that bracket. It's always been a little bit of a Fingerspitzengefühl, which is a German word to basically mean that we're trying this out and through an iterative, ongoing process, you get to learn better what speaker scores look like. Imagine that speaker scores are something that is divided in a normal manner. So, it is, so because of the talent pool that exists at the Euros, it is more likely that you're going to see a speech that exists between a 17 and 80 than it is in a speech that is an 85 or, or a 65. But 85s, even 90s, 65s, even 60s or below, they can all and do all happen at competitions. So don't feel afraid to think about what speaker score you want to give. And don't feel afraid to use the entire scale if you, be if you believe that the bracket and your gut feeling on how persuasive the speech was actually fit within that speaker score. During a deliberation, you want to think about the following things. So if you're comparing two teams alongside one another, chairs probably want to make sure that panelists get the first say. That is important because the chair already has a large amount of power. You can determine who speaks first, and you're often one of the more senior judges, which means that you often have a tendency to, be a, to, to think that you know more, or to get the feeling that people will listen to you. But it's the, it's the case that one, every judge on a panel can have a useful discussion and a useful contribution to that discussion. And two, part of the reason why we do judging isn't just to make sure that we have the best goal, although that is the most important part, but also to make sure that we know whether someone is a good judge or not. And we don't have that full information on everyone if you're looking from the point of a CA team, certainly if you're looking from the point of an individual judge. So you might want to find out whether this judge can be useful for you in terms of providing useful contributions towards judging the debate. So try and make sure that the panelists get to have a first go and that they can defend their positions. Try and always start with the minority position first. So the group of people who are in the minority on holding a particular view. So if you're with a panel of three, get the one who goes for opening opposition rather than opening government to speak first. So they have a chance to give the best possible case but also to make sure that you don't start badgering upon this person because it might often be the case if you give the other team a to say first then one person may go here's a couple of reasons why i believe an opening government wins and then before the person who believes in opening opposition case has a chance to respond then all of a sudden the other person might interject and say okay but that's really cool but i also have a lot of reasons that opening government is going to win and then that means that opening opposition's defenders need to respond to so much stuff that they might find it almost impossible to react to everything in a very neat manner. 
and that might derail the discussion. So have the minority viewpoint go first. Make sure that once people's big reasons for going one way or the other are raised, that they have the room to respond. I would suggest to everyone that they judge comparatively. So what that means is that you don't just say, I thought opening opposition was good, but you say, I thought opening opposition was better than closing opposition because of this or that reason. In that way, you make sure that the panel discussion goes smoothly towards the heart of the disagreement. What are the reasons why on a comparative between two teams, one of these teams is winning? Now let's look at a couple of last tips. Let's first talk about chairs. As said, chairs have a couple of important roles. They guide the discussion, first of all. And when you guide the discussion, it is important to understand that you are the one who is in charge of who gets to say when. So as a chair, you want to be fair to each and every one on the panel. That means that if you're noticing that someone, for instance, is, feels unable to speak up, is you want to make sure that that person gets the opportunity to say something. You want to give them that opportunity and make sure that everyone can fully contribute to the discussion. Secondly, don't feel afraid to enter within your own opinion. You're probably chair for a reason, and one of those reasons very often correlates highly with the fact that you can judge pretty well. Which means that what we want to get from you is also probably good reasons that you have for supporting a call. But it's useful to keep those more near the middle or the end of a discussion comparing two teams, to make sure that all the panelists feel that they have the opportunity to respond to that. The third thing is you want to gently remind Wings if you get the feeling that Wings may not be judging comparatively or be maybe making any of the other mistakes that we've outlined in the judge briefing. For instance, that people think, oh, I'm crediting one argument a lot because I really happen to like that argument. Or I'm crediting the amount of arguments that was brought rather than what the arguments did to the debate. You want to gently remind people if they're making these kind of errors because that is useful furthering of the discussion because it might then change someone's opinion. So you want to keep an eye out for that. The same goes with speaker scores. Often chairs, you lead that discussion. Often you start firstly with suggesting a speaker score and then some disagreements may happen. Feel free to welcome the disagreement. Use the speaker skill or use descriptive language in which you argue, for instance, why you found a speech persuasive, which argument, which example, which stance, which pose people took. All of them can be probably helpful in order to make sure that you're guiding the discussion in that regard. Thirdly, when you go and call things to a vote, make sure that you make it very clear that everyone knows what they're voting on, so on which comparisons they are voting. Make also clear that you tell everyone who has voting rights. It might be the case that there's a trainee judge, and trainee judges, they don't really differ from any other judge, except for the one thing, which is that they don't have voting rights. So they, their vote can be cast in favor of breaking a deadlock or even to come to a consensus decision. They're there to, to engage in a discussion and to learn from the process. For wings, it's important to note that the chair might feel a little bit stressed. It, it can be the case that there's 15 minutes on the clock and the call might be very difficult. It is a chair that's going to be frowned upon if we're at 15 minutes and no balance has come in. So the chair needs to go over the competing considerations of making sure that we discuss the debate as, and your concerns about the debate as too roughly as possible, whilst at the same time ensuring that we keep to the time limit. Therefore, try to make your points both concise and comparative. So don't, for instance, continue talking about something that's already been decided. And try to make sure that you, in that way, come to your points in a clean way possible. And that will be tremendously helpful. The way to do it is to help yourself by prepare yourself very well. So for instance, after every team has spoken, try and think of where am I currently placing these teams? So after leader of opposition, you start thinking, okay, did I think that that speech was stronger or less strong than the prime minister? And the same goes for DPM, for DLO, at which point you can probably try and come with a judge call on how the first half went. And then you're going to look at, then you listen to the extension from the member of government and you start thinking, what is this at? Do I find these additions persuasive? Does it help me to make sure that I believe that this team is winning from one of the two teams in the opening half? You do the same for the opposition member, and then you're going to see whether the whips change your initial feelings 
of the second half after the member speeches. That's then important to make sure that you get to the call in the right way possible, but also already critically examining the reasons for the call, first of all. It also means you can breathe a little during the adjudication discussion, because you've already done a lot of the thinking and a lot of the clarifying in your mind during the debate. So it isn't the case that you're a blank slate going into these 50 minutes and thinking, what the hell am I saying? No, instead what it is like is you spend an hour thinking, and you now can summarize this hour thinking in brief bits in comparing these themes. And that way would be incredibly helpful. Don't feel afraid to tell other people in the panel that you're uncertain about something or that you are swayed or that you're sticking to your convictions. All of this is useful information that guides the process along. It also won't look bad upon you. Many people switch their positions, even at elite levels. And that is because they've been generally persuaded by a very clever comment that someone else made in the panel. It's more important that we come to the decision of you right than the decision that you initially had. So initial calls are in no way things you need to stick to. They guide initial discussions, they inform your initial opinions, but feel very free to have your opinions changed. That's the same as, that, as it happens with debating. You might see emotion and think, there's no possible way I would feel confident arguing in favor of this. Then you listen to a debate, and you suddenly realize, wait, there's lots of prop arguments I actually agree with. The same thing can happen with judging. You can suddenly be convinced that your initial call was wrong. That's no worry at all. It's actually a very beautiful thing because it is debating in action. So don't feel pressured, but also at the same time, don't feel hesitant to be flexible in the way that you've seen a debate. Importantly, it might be the case that during panel discussion, you're going to be asked um, do you have any feedback for this team? Or after the panel discussion, teams will come up to you and ask you, but can I? Can you give me some feedback? If you want to know more about that, I would suggest you watch one of our other videos done by Yair. He is going to give you lots of hopefully very good, uh, hopefully I've watched it, it's pretty good, feedback on how to deliver effective feedback to teams. So how to deliver an oral adjudication. I hope this was helpful for all of you. If you have any questions, feel free to add them in the comments or feel free to come and talk to us during the Nobis at EUDC briefing or whenever so that we can make sure that you feel well prepared to judge at Novisat. We hope you're going to have a great time, of which judging is often an important but not the only part at Euros. Have a safe trip and see you there.